her life. <laughs> so, welcome everyone and, and welcome Corinne. It's so lovely to have you back again and uh, talking about neurodiversity and um it the last the last um live we had was so full of information it was fantastic so um this evening we'll launch straight into it and um if you could let everyone know what we're going to cover tonight and we'll go from there <laughs> yeah thank you so much for having me Carl. it's so lovely to see you I had lots of good response from the last live. So Carly and me, we do that volunteer to provide support for families. It is sort of our joint mission to provide good information, give access to good resources, support children with learning difficult behaving and really take the stigma away and really just put all the love around parents and families and support mm -hmm. teachers in any way and form we can. And so this is a little bit um, something we love to do for the greater community to mm -hmm. connect with you guys, to support you. We know from our work experience, um, many parents are really emotionally burned out and really haven't had enough time to, you know, look after themselves for relationships or haven't had a free evening or weekend for days. And yeah, so my name is Corinne Allen. Many of you know me. I'm the manager of Capit Neurotherapy. I offer sensory integration therapy, behavioral support therapy, art therapy, and as well work um, with ACC and with um, the DHB for mental health support. About 50% of, of our clients are young children, which are on the neurodiverse spectrum with all kinds of challenges. We have as well courses which help parents to understand like what dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, and all those difficult <laughs> words are. <laughs> and, oh, um, <laughs> we work with the art education together because the art, art education, Kali, she has done this really, really good resource website which just connects all we have a lot of support in new zealand but it's sometimes hard to know where to start and Absolutely. so um yeah so i've been working with children on neurodiverse spectrum for over 15 years i specialize in children which complex learning and behaving they may have add they may have as well this calculia, but they may have as well sensory sensitivity and they just don't cope in those busy classrooms and have often sensory meltdowns which are nothing to do with bad behaving but unfortunately and i don't want to hurt any teacher or anybody out there uh, but many of the resources in the classrooms are outdated and I teachers agree. really they come to me and to Kali and they really want to learn but sometimes they don't get the funding or sometimes they can't access really good resource um courses so we've been doing a lot of work in the last few years and we see a lot of positive changes we're very thankful for that but we know mm -hmm. there is still work to do Absolutely. um the Ministry of Education just has launched a new in the, um, integration plan for children with special needs and they really have done an amazing job. So if these new guidelines for integrated learning in New Zealand in the schools get being put in place over the next few years, it really will make a lot of positive changes for future generations. And so, you know, that yeah. really has been heard on the highest level. But yeah. to change structure and to change philosophy and cultures, it just always takes a bit of time. Mm, a lot of time. Um, and sometimes it takes a complete collapse of a system to be able to build a new one. Um, yeah, but I think that's where we are worldwide. None of the system absolutely. works for the planet, for humans, for animals, for governments. 
and we have to come up with better solutions. But New Zealand, compared to other countries, I find them, you know, what just so they took the Ministry of Education five years um to really implement those changes specialists been asking for and teacher and principal mm. and resource teachers and I really feel they have done a really good job with those guidelines mm -hmm. but um, you know teams have to sit down and principals and teacher have to sit down and see how can they, they take implement the time that. yeah yes make the time so um Karin Tonight you're going to talk about observation plans, is that right? Um, yeah, we have three things we try to cover and we try to do that relatively fast just to give you an overview. But Carly and me, we are here if you have more questions. We'd just like to give you absolutely. a little bit um an overview. So the first thing we're going to talk is observation plan, how to do it and why. The second thing is the 10 common flags for children which are may under neurodiverse spectrum or have sensory processing challenges. And the third thing is a free resource list we ha I have created and Kali has it too, which we think is very helpful for parents if anybody would be interested to read through that free resource list and work through it because it will give clarity how to move forward. Indeed, indeed. and um... I'll remind everyone um, when we get to that, but if you do want a copy of that free resource, please just, um, especially if you're just watching, um, after, you know, not live, um, please just write um, checklist in the comments and I will um, DM you and um, I'll get that list to you. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, that's a free symptoms checklist for sensory processing. It's structured um, baby years, toddler years, preschool, school, teenager, and adult sense. So if you have like a, a primary school child, you maybe just do this section. But if you want to go back to toddler and baby years, you go, oh, I have noticed that, but I didn't knew that was something mm. I had to, um, that's something to do with sensory processing. So the first thing we want to talk tonight about is observation plan. You can ask occupational therapists or teachers to do an observation plan. But it is quite often, they are quite often really, really busy and information gets lost. So the best, there's no person which knows your child better than you. You, your okay. husband, your family, your uncle, your auntie, your siblings, you are really engaged with that child. You love that child. You have observed those challenges for a long time. And so if you have observation plan and you will come to me as a specialist, it will give me straight away really good information and I could guide you through a clinical diagnostic if you want or educational assessment or whatever you would like. And it would make a lot, it would make a two year process probably to about a year. So it's Brilliant. that's one thing our observation plan gives us really accurate information what we're dealing with or what the child deals with it gives you as well 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 clarity in which area the child struggles and where the child possibly has strengths and we can go into a strengths approach and solution orientation mm -hmm. and um, it's really easy to do so if you, I'm quite old fashioned, I like to write things down in my little diary, but maybe you just have a list on the phone or you maybe just um, have a whiteboard and you just make notes as you see them and you make a, a photo and you store them. However yeah. you want to do it, it just needs to be recorded. So what you need to record or what you should and what would be really good information is just start um like with the age of the child um as well is it a boy or girl or change or what whatever um mm. you are referring to and then maybe 
um, to start with sleep. Like when does the child goes to bed, when it wakes up? And mm -hmm. if you have like a list, like for a month, I usually just make a list and add in the front certain things and then just tick them off. So mm -hmm. you can go like, you know, usually it sleeps eight hours, but then you have maybe a period of three, four days, the child had a cold or a cough and it only woke up three, four times during the night and his behaving really changed and it gives you an indication. So just notice the sleep. It doesn't matter half an hour earlier or later, but just generally, you know, do you need the sleep? How many hours sleep? The second thing is how long is the sleeping routine? Does it take 45 minutes to put the child to bed or does it take one and a half hours or two and a half hours? <laughs> and when you yeah. say good night to the child, does it constantly wake up and cry for you or do you need to co-parent sleep? Do you basically need to stay there? till you fall asleep <laughs> or the child <laughs> falls asleep but um that's as well sort of you know we start bedtime routine maybe at seven we have a bath and brushing teeth and story time mm -hmm. is the child at eight o'clock settled or does it go till nine thirty I want milk I want a hug I want <laughs> so just sort of roughly how many hours and how long is the bedtime routine mm -hmm. then um you can make um like notes about about like maybe your child always cries when he brushes teeth or he cries when you should brush here or it has a huge meltdown if it has showers so you could write shower and you could make like stars three stars is a major major challenge with a 45 minute meltdown mm -hmm. two stars is child i don't want to and resist and refuses and one star is with a little bit positive um um support the child gets through it so yeah. you maybe have um one week one star or you notice always the last two weeks of the terms everything goes to custard or you maybe notice if the child has to go to the father and not to say anything negative about the father but there is a change in routine and maybe parents are separated and each child the child has to go to the father when it comes back the sleeping routine is different or mm -hmm. or it really struggles with transition so that all of those things are important so make notes about food is your child sensitive towards smell texture or um taste like texture would mean your child would eat oven potatoes but never mashed potatoes or if you change the perfume, it doesn't want a hug because it can't tolerate it. So, um, and then, yeah, just to go through the day, like how is the morning routine? How are transitions from the bedroom into the car to school? Mm. Um, how is eating? Is the lunchbox not touched or is it touched? And if the lunchbox mm. is not touched, is the child coming home? And you don't have to write crap in the house and it goes in a massive meltdown or what how many how much water your child drinks is the water bottle empty if it comes home has it a water before it goes to school after school before maybe six o'clock not too much before bedtime because we don't want them up all night but um you know how much water intake water is extremely important for the nervous system and the neurons and cogn cognitive mm -hmm. functions um then as well social interaction do we have constant jealousy or do we do we can we not share certain things or do we have like if a lego figure is moved it creates a meltdown do we have certain things need to you know all all those things and um i really would go sleep sleep routine grooming that means brushing teeth hair and showers i would mm -hmm. make a comment about getting dressed is um the child always wants the same clothes or only soft pants and mm -hmm. nothing mm -hmm. with zip and buttons 
I would look about the food, I would look about the water, social interaction. Yes, if the child is in a small group and he knows the people, it does fine, but in a new situation, mm -hmm. it creates anxiety. Um, does the child understand what humor is and what teasing is like if somebody yeah. really happily laughs about a joke it's very different than when somebody teases mm -hmm. can the child let go of emotion so if something happened two three weeks later we still have the same subject repeatedly so repetitive where is my Lego? Or what time do you come to pick me up? Or how many stories are you going to read me tonight? Do we have repetitive questioning? And as well, do we have maybe fixations? Do we may have problems with transitions? So if you not have it, don't write it down. You may be only said, I only have problems with sleep and with clothes, nothing else. Or somebody else says, I only have problems with eating and sound, but all the other things are not. But even you can see, is it every day or is the child only when it's tired? Or is it different and they displace, but the mommy plays where siblings are or different structure it affects the mm. child not to go to say one person is better than the other you are fantastic parents but it just no it tells us a little bit about yeah. the child's triggers so yeah. it's nothing to do with parenting you know the normal mm. parenting yeah. courses and the normal advice you should discipline your child is basically bad advice it doesn't work it's very outdated and to give parents the feeling they're not good to a good job is really really bad because yeah. um those children are different in a loving caring and supportive I really have absolutely nothing negative to say, but they may respond if it's too loud and other children can cope, or yeah. they may have anxiety before assembly. And we can't just go, oh, we discipline the child or put the child 10 minutes in the bedroom because the, the behaving is a language towards something the child it's an indication of the yeah. going on, yes. 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 Um, I, just one question, um, Karina, how long should an um, observation plan continue? So well, ideally six weeks, that okay. would be perfect, but mm. minimum three weeks. And if you actually just make one plan, literally windows, 10 minutes, just like date and a few free things or sleep right. and yeah. so and you just take it off or you make index one star is okay two stars is 45 minutes three stars is over an hour or so mm -hmm. you can do it very simple and you print out the same and if you have three we can see really ah oh, we struggle with getting dressed ah oh, we struggle with transitioning mm -hmm. and we can give really mm -hmm. specific information and it's mm -hmm. it's actually amazing what the observation plan can do, how tailored we can give you advice and mm -hmm. how fast we can help you because we don't need to have the child five, six weeks in therapy to get the before information get to before yeah. we mm -hmm. can go to the solution. And you save yourself thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's mm -hmm. no joke. If if yeah. I do it or or, or somebody else um, you know, some specialists charge two hundred dollars an hour, and so um, you know, it's so simple. And even on Pinterest or other places, you can go observation plan for sensory processing, mm -hmm. and you look at two, three, and you say, "Oh, I like that," and you maybe mm -hmm. just change it a bit, and you have it. And um, if you guys struggle, then let me know. And me and Carly, we maybe make Absolutely. a little sample. But it's super simple. I mean, I used to have a whiteboard, and that's how I functioned. And I noticed uh, if what we have it? more than one afternoon activity, things go to custard. <laughs> also, <laughs> so then I kind of, ah, that's that's the problem on a Wednesday. Okay, mm -hmm. I have to make changes or I have to structure my week. So observation plan super important. Mm -hmm. And 
just it's so simple just go sleep getting up school in between school, school afternoon yeah. just go say, and, and probably... note what you see yeah i was going to say it will probably pay to work with the teacher if they're at school um to talk about what their day was yeah, like and school. I mean, I had an um, observation plan I did for myself and I asked the teacher, could you just, um, and I gave her three little stamps, you know, good morning, yeah. lunchtime, yeah. afternoon, and, and just ask her to make stamps. And I could yeah. see very clearly sort of from Thursday afternoon on, um, things change and then we decided yeah. to give the child midweek a half a day off and suddenly yeah. things fall wonderful into place but i mean my uh, teachers i never experienced teacher which wanted to do they would do observation plan for me but if i made mm -hmm. it and said could you just help me for two weeks i need to figure out some things is it always or is it just a tome or is it at school and at home do you dis observe the same things and they've been really really helpful and it created yeah. actually a relationship and it created um a deeper understanding mm. um, and what i don't want is that those children being seen a problem children i don't want those mm -hmm. children to not be included on birthday parties or social interaction. I don't want the children to feel there is something wrong with me. I want them to go, I have a little challenge, but mommy and my teacher and my friends help me with that. And those are the things I'm really good at. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. um, they learn. We know that 80% of learning difficulties are emotional blockages mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. only 20 percent is to provide the right resources for the right problem so that the child shut, shuts down internally because I, I can't remember the numbers or i can't remember how to make mm -hmm. a or, D or you know it's it's really that's why this emotional strengthening and as well a child darling you're a good child but when mm -hmm the alarm goes or the fire alarm that scares you and i understand that but it doesn't mean that you are we, we just have to make sure you know where your headphones are or other things mm -hmm. so observation plan super important way more important than you think and it really can save you so much money you may yeah. not even need a clinical diagnostic because you have clearly outlined where the challenges is you need somebody which gives you the right advice and then we put it in place we look a little bit back after a few weeks does it work does it need to be adapted and you we want happy children and happy families that's exactly. what we want so you're meeting needs basically yeah meeting yeah needs. it's like you know if if i tell the architect I need a bathroom renovation. He asked me, what do you need? <laughs> and what is your budget? Well, exactly. and how much time do I have? We and find that it we... can't really help yeah. me, you know. And so... how often do we just do things to kids <laughs> rather mm. than with them, you know? Mm. Um, mm. It, 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 it's, it's, it's something... And it's actually amazing what I find as well with those observation plans. I do that with all the parents. And then they come and they cry and they're worn out and they're worried about their children and we put it in place and six weeks later I go look to the observation plan how has that changed now and we can really see oh we don't have problems with transitions anymore oh we all our meltdowns rather than one half hours they are 30 minutes now or they're 20 minutes they've gone down over time and they've gone down in frequency so we go we're actually doing good work here and we yeah. actually have something to measure we not go three four months later oh you know I'm so worried I can't think and we go no look here we have solved this problem and this problem we have made progress but here that's something we have to come with more resources that's not yeah. quite done yet and that's what I think it really gives parents as well confidence rather than go, oh, you're so sensitive or your child is sensitive to go, hey, that's really judgmental. If you're really interested, 
interested what's going on i'm happy to give you appropriate information so mm. you can support mm. my child and this is actually what we do and this is why we're doing it so it, it, it really yeah. you become a bit of advocate for your child and mm. you really understand the topic Absolutely. so Observation plan important. If you guys need help, reach out and me and Kylie will, will work something out for you. Absolutely. So the next theme we have is um the red flags. Mm. So you can your child can be on the neurodiverse spectrum. Neurodiverse spectrum is a huge, huge big term mm -hmm. for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So under neurodiversity is attention deficit, is sensory processing, it's dyspraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, mm. dysgraphia. There sometimes Tourette's is in it, sometimes not because Tourette's is actually a neurological disorder. Um, there is as well sensory processing in it there. So it's a huge big term and it oh, changes yeah. like we used to have Asperger, we don't have that anymore. We just talk about autism now. Yeah. So yeah. it does sometimes epilepsy is in it, which some children have it, but you can as well just have epilepsy and have yeah. nothing to do with and not be so, neurodiverse yeah. so it, it is a little bit a term which a lot of things are in it and some things um the dsm5 and other um other tools we use in new zealand for diagnostic um, some specialists are having different views but that's mm -hmm. not our topic tonight it just a term for a lot of things which we know the brain functions slightly different and learning difficulties has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence no. we have different types of intelligence from emotional intelligence to practical intelligence to creative intelligence to language you know there are different types of intelligence and different types we learn some people learn visual, some people learn practical. Absolutely. So it, it it has nothing to do. What it means that in the left side of the brain, where we have reading, motor development, language and, and, and responses, the inputs get... So the right brain dominance, isn't it? Really? Well, not not always, <laughs> but yeah. it means that mm -hmm. we have there some challenges and we need mm -hmm. to find out what is the challenge. And if we have like maybe this calculia, which is difficulty with numbers or this mm -hmm. graphia, difficulty with forming letters, um, we can strengthen the right side of the brain with creativity, art and music and dancing and, and swimming and sport. And mm -hmm. then the brain does that. So it means yeah. you still have it, but you have learned to overcome those challenges. Yeah. So it's neurodiversity <laughs> is not, um, it's not like I have it for a week or two and it's gone. No. <laughs> it is You've something, you know, yeah. you like attention deficit is always there it doesn't matter in which class which teacher how many children it's just something i either struggle to concentrate or have a hyper focus and I read a harry potter book in a whole weekend so mm. it's it's we have both but it means that i i was diagnosed with 40 with adhd and I never knew it, but then it thought, oh, it makes sense. And mm -hmm. as well, I have dyslexia and um, dyscalculia. And but I did well in life, and and I did study it. But I had to learn how I oh, study yeah. and how yeah, I remember. Yeah, I'm dyslexic as well. I, mm -hmm. I was one of the very few. <laughs> Very few people of my generation that were actually diagnosed as Oh, okay. Yeah, so, I knew um, was, yeah. And yeah, I just picked um, it up when my children had similar challenges. I thought, oh, there is yeah. a name for it. I didn't even know. And that's when I started to educate myself. Yeah. And that's when I started 
to understand the complexity of it, which for me as a child, it caused me shame and it caused me a feeling I wasn't good enough. It's and really I true. think yeah. we really until, can... Until they realised, um, uh, because in those days, they did the discrepancy, you know, it, 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 they, it, it was, they used to do the IQ test and compare it with your reading age. And um, at the age of 11, I had a reading age of seven, but I had, I was in the genius. <laughs> in the yeah, genius, um, yeah. and I had this same. IQ. So quite often, uh, what we you would be called today twice exceptional, where you have mm. a really, really mm. high intelligence, you are almost like in the really high um gifted areas with yeah. scores mm -hmm. and you have element which are in the gifted area and elements which are a little bit below yeah. and and so that's yeah. called twice exceptional but um just to tell you you know i went personally to a huge journey and as well as a mother i've been once upon a time mm -hmm. in bed crying not knowing how to help my child and i find the journey i've been on empowering and i want that for I was lucky I had other mothers which helped mm. me and it really made a difference to understand uh, that it is not that I'm a bad parent or I'm bad parenting. No, I'm an excellent not. mom and a loving and caring mom. But there is something, how to train a child, how to hold a pencil grip and how to formulate it with this graph here, which mm. I need a really clear approach how to do that mm. because mm. that's mm. what is needed. So I think that's why it's important. It's important to understand, is it dyslexia or visual processing disorder? It's important, is it global developmental delay or dyspraxia, motor movement? Mm. It really is important because if we have the right um, criteria, we know what it is, we can really give the right resources yeah. and you can train muscles and you can train fine motor skills and other things. So let's start with the red flags for sensory processing okay. disorder, okay. which is part of the neurodiverse spectrum. You yeah. can have only sensory processing disorder, or you may have attention deficit and sensory processing. So <laughs> it can come in a combination with other things, or you may have absolutely nothing, but you are have sensory processing information mm -hmm. so if you think about the body we have body mind and soul but we have as well the central nervous system and under the central nervous system we have the sensory system so the mm -hmm. sensory system regulates the eight senses touch vision taste proprioceptive system um, mm -hmm. the vestibular system balance all um, I haven't written them out down, but it's it's eight senses. Um, mm. Balance is one, hearing, uh, touch, vision, uh, yeah. proprioceptive, uh, yeah. olivectory, gustatory, yeah. and um, proprioceptive and what is balance? Yeah, balance and posture. So. Yeah. Um, they all have fancy names, but um, that that's something else. So in my course, Raising Sensational Children, I have one module about the eight senses and mm -hmm. what kind of behaving we see in each sense. So if you want a little bit more information as well, PDFs and very clear going through each very sense cool. and explain it really in detail. It's mm -hmm. on the website and Kali maybe can put a little link into it. Mm -hmm. And there is um the eight the eight senses and the sensory system and sensory processing more explained in detail. Let's talk about the red flags of sensory processing. You may have all 10 
you may only have two or three. You <laughs> don't need to tick them all, okay? Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. still can have sensory processing and you can have it very mild or medium or severe, or you can have a real sound sensitivity, but other things not. Yes. So we yes. just tell you the most common red flags. And mm -hmm. if you go, I have maybe four, five, six, and I see them not just once, they, they always there. It yes. is maybe really good to go to the checklist and then maybe as well to reach out to Carly or me. What is the yes. next step? And diagnostic is one thing, but even if you see the sign and you not have a diagnostic, it still makes sense to give you the right support to help your child with mm. those challenges. So, yes. um you know diagnostics some parents want it and some not so mm -hmm. the 10 red flags number one distress with loud loud noise the vacuum cleaner mm -hmm. goes on the child holds the ears and cries mm -hmm. sirens or um yelling <laughs> yeah or other things the child cries it finds it really distressing a loud voice or any loud sound it literally almost creates fear and the child mm -hmm. some children freeze and some children try to run away and mm -hmm. some children just get visually upset mm -hmm. the um second one distressed with touch so that's a little bit if we if we shower if we mm -hmm. brush here if we brush teeth mm -hmm. um or even sometimes refusing a hug, or if we put sun lotion on, the child cries. Those things, anything mm. to do with touch, the child finds um, distressing. And mm. quite often, if a child has touch sensitivity, we see real issues with crying every morning tears. Um, there is a lot of solutions in that area with touch. There's a lot of sensory um providing products which really help with touch mm. sensitivity um difficulty regulating emotions so they they can be little hurricanes or they can be angels but it can you know it it can be too hot in the car and they can create a meltdown or it can be yeah. um too noisy at new world and the child can't regulate yeah, it yeah. and then yeah. it starts to cry so difficulty regulating emotions it's not a naughty child it's not bad behaving the sensory system is overloaded the child can't tolerate mm -hmm. it and it creates stress emotional stress for the child mm -hmm. um they're often picky eaters they often have what we call safe food like fries or neutral crackers and um, anything like tomato mashed potato or even banana mm -hmm. which you maybe need to cut up the fruit and they need a little um, fork because they don't like to touch it so quite often picky eater and they ask for the same food again and again which is called safe foods they know I can mm. it's not too strong smell it's the texture and the taste and there we have to really help parents to make changes as well on the plate. If I have mashed potato, mince and broccoli, that's fine. But as soon as the mashed potato touches the, 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 the mince, <laughs> then it goes into tears and we can't eat it. Mm. So little things like that. Difficulty um, with messy hands. They don't like Play-Doh. They don't like... Okay. Um, anything messy and that's a real challenge because they don't like messy hands they don't touch and then they don't train the sense like other children which naturally pick up everything and try and sometimes even they avoid playgrounds because they don't want to touch mm. something or um the, you know it's really, um, like that 
Mm. Yeah, and it's really you want to bake them with them or do art or you want to do play doh or you want to do play yeah. in the sand, and they just start to cry or they they ask you ten times a day to wash your hands because mm. um so and I really think the messy hands that something with a specialist like me really can work with, and you really can overcome that and then the child joins in and does things and applies itself. That's really something we can train quite well. Mm -hmm. Um, and does not like to lean back. That's really interesting. Oh. So leaning mm -hmm. back, um, like sometimes you pick them up or you you play with them and they start to cry, um, and it has to do. I'm not quite sure what that is because um, could it be the vestibular? Yeah, it has it's must have it. to do with the vestibular system and on the balance and things. The a lot of children don't like that. Um but they're constantly moving, so that's as well something up and down the the the, the whole way and over the sofa. The sofa is an indoor <laughs> trampoline and up and down the chair and yeah. So constantly moving as well in the classroom, they roll around on the floor while the teacher tries to read a book or they, they, they everybody works and they suddenly get up and do something mm -hmm. and they just constantly move. Um but then the interesting part, they don't like to lean backwards, but they love spinning, successive spinning. Mm -hmm. I mean more and more on a swing and turn me a so that's as well something quite often they are floppy that means they have not a good core strings they have not strong muscles you go with them walking for 10 minutes and each mm -hmm. time after 10 minutes i'm tired i'm tired mm -hmm. and um you know sitting up or they like, like on the table like that just even mm -hmm. so that's something which you really um have to strengthen like in occupational therapy or yourself with swimming and other things mm. so that the core and then oh, the muscle okay. strings and so they quite often um have that it can be as well that this is dyspraxia and has nothing to do with sensory processing which dyspraxia is motor movement coordination mm. challenges but then you don't see that difficulties with hear or transition or sound you mm. just see it in the motor movement mm -hmm. and the and, other and we'll things be covering, that, covering that in our next session yeah. yeah um difficulties with transition and difficulties with struggling sleep all parents with children which are on the neurodiverse spectrum say their children from baby right from the gecko on our bed sleepers mm -hmm. that's something we notice they have such a busy mind to calm down and go to sleep seems to be a real challenge we have solutions for that and homeopathic solutions which work mm -hmm. very well we've been using for years with our clients and only had good feedback mm -hmm. um, so those are the 10 major challenges and you can see yeah. if you would go is it ah oh, there's challenges with hearing challenges with touch challenges with movement challenges with taste and smell you can see in every area of the senses the child yeah. has problems but as i said you maybe only have three but those are constantly and the other ones not or yeah. you maybe have have only the sound sensitivity or only mm. um, the touch sensitivity and you still your child still has sensory processing but it's just a milder form so yeah. that's um just to say you know those are the things we see it doesn't mean every child is individual and every child has a little bit of different mix Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so those are the red flags. If we see them constantly, it's really good to check for sensory processing and it's really good to um, 
and there are solutions for yeah for everything for like if yeah. you have sound sensitivity we have the calmer product we can use which is fantastic it sits yeah. inside the ear yeah. you can yeah. hear everything talk but the whole sound is a little bit further down um with, with touch sensitivity we have clothes without tags we have underwear without strong um elastics yeah. or socks yeah yeah um we have pencil grips we have weight blankets we have everything and mm. but i don't want you to go and spend so much money because those products are important so if you know what the problem is i can tell you the best solution that you only plan. buy yeah. what you need and that, that makes it much more efficient and um you know as well um uh, much more economical yeah well. <laughs> yeah and we can maybe that's an idea if we have after the next one which we talk about motor function we maybe could if there is interest like carly you know talk a little bit how to do a toma sensory diet and how to set up a sensory corner for your child to calm mm -hmm. down but only if there is interest we maybe would add another life yes. and do that. Yeah, that would be awesome yes so okay. this checklist here, as I said, has really clear questions. So like preschool, um, is your child unsure how to move your body and, and unintentionally bumps into people or into things and it causes friction in the playgroup because children say he always bumps into me, but he doesn't do it on purpose. Um, but does your child have difficulty learning new motor tasks? So it's maybe four, but it can't use the scissors or things. So okay. very clear questions. It's for free. Okay. It's based on the international standards for sensory processing. Um, it is a good checklist. It's what you would pay money if you go somewhere. And it is how... Like America, which is quite leading in that area, or some of the leading institutes in America, uh, but they do questions, and then we have overworked it, and we have mm. modernized it, mm. and it's ready for you. Oh, brilliant! And again, just reminding everybody who's watching the recording, if you do want that checklist, please just. Put checklist in the comments and I will DM you and get uh, one of those checklists to you. Mm -hmm. well, Corinne, I want to thank you very, very much for all your generosity of giving your knowledge to all of us. And, and even I learned <laughs> me, me being like 20 years in the whole in the whole mm. business of specialist teaching um i still learned things that i never knew before like the full core you know core strength and and the leaning back mm. and when I yeah but it, i mean i didn't know those things too that those are things we have um have mm. um just you know which we have added on to the common sense another thing is I haven't talked about and I know we have to finish just very quickly. We sometimes see parents going, so, oh, we have no problems at school and at home. It's like that. So that doesn't mean that school... Um, that's a better that, job than that, you do. That's <laughs> called masking. So the child yeah. is masking. It doesn't cry in the classroom because it it's afraid of teasing or mm -hmm. it, it, it tries to just pretend to eat a bit lunch not to get in trouble or so yeah. but it a lot of children mask or they're very quiet or they're not do anything because of the fear of judgment mm. and they come home to their safe place where they're loved unconditionally and yeah. they let go of that stress and it's really mm -hmm. hard on the child and really hard on the parent but yes. we see masking, a lot of girls are really good at masking. I had mm -hmm. about six teenagers here, teenager girls from the Capiti Coast, which uh, all of them, they came to me and I said to parents, I'm really, really quite sure they are high-functioning autistic. 
and they had so good masking skills and all of them have been diagnosed with high functioning autistic and the parents all have written to me you know the guidelines I gave them how much more happy the child is because with masking comes anxiety okay Absolutely. it's so so hard to mask and to put this face up i'm completely I hope, but yeah. it causes me so much stress i come home i have a meltdown i feel bad about it i've hurt my parents feelings or siblings it causes me more stress and mm. um you know, and girls are really good at masking with boys. We see a lot of anger relative early between mm -hmm. the age mm -hmm. three, four, five. And with girls, we see a lot of really avoidance or be, they're really quiet and parents come and think they're shy, but it's actually a coping mechanism. A coping because, mechanism so yeah. challenging behaving comes if the demand out shines the the tools the child has to cope with the demand so the demand yeah. is way higher than what the child can yeah. cope with yeah. and that's where we see challenging behaving so yeah. the child struggles to focus and to write and to remember names and yeah. teachers and every day a different routine and it's just too much and then there is pressure you should finish that now or you should so the demand is too high and i have seen children which had two years of intensive help and you know you it's amazing it's absolutely amazing what can be done yeah. especially early intervention but if the child doesn't have help and it notes it's, it's different it quite often it goes into negative self-talk or self-judgment and quite yeah. often i have adults which literally in their 40s work through those emotional traumas um which because they just been seen as difficult children and they really tried very hard and they just couldn't cope with certain things right. so um yeah, I really think <coughs> um, I see a lot of children with masking and young children, which, yeah. um, I, you know. I totally get that because um, I've seen it with my my own daughter mm -hmm. and um, how, I mean, she, she she's high functioning, you, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that there's any problems there at all but her anxiety does come out at home um or yeah. did she's now at university and mm -hmm. she's she's managing she's managing her anxiety fairly well but um it it is totally um she's she's a, a supreme master at masking mm. Well, I have children at the age of five with separation anxiety. I mean, yep. mm -hmm. I really, and I think COVID, you know, there was a, a moment everybody was at home and we nurtured yeah. Yeah. Them, and then suddenly the world has changed and we've been released back to school, kindergarten work, and we just had to cope. And we had a lot of support while we've been at home, but how to re-engage into the world where exactly. everything has changed. It is quite, um, it was quite interesting to see that on a global stage and mm -hmm. as well how many parents have noticed in those, like in New Zealand, we had four weeks a lockdown. They have noticed things observing the children at home learning Absolutely. that they haven't been aware of. So it was really interesting how um, we create a pressure and challenges on many sides, but it created as well um, an a awareness, opportunity to make yeah. changes mm -hmm. for children. And, um, you know, we, we have seen a lot of young children coming out of COVID 
and anxiety levels been relatively high. Been relatively high so yeah. that's um sometimes it's the environment and that can happen through life at all the time. But yeah. um children which are on the neurodiverse spectrum, they really have extra challenges. Yeah. They, they can do amazingly well academically and socially and have positive relationship, but they certainly need help throughout Thank those you. primary and college years. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karina. I'm going You're to welcome. get on with your evening and um, we will be back next week. Okay, thank you so much for having me. It's been always fun to do that for you and the community. And we hope it has provided a lot of information. Yeah, your generosity and your knowledge are phenomenal. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Have a nice evening. Take care. See you next week. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.